our coach has officially closed the door, so <laughs> we can now officially start. Anyway, our speaker today is Kim Kunz, who is going to be our Steve Murray Distinguished Lecturer. He's our next U.S. Lecturer for the year. Um, he got his PhD from Maryland in 2000, and then he mostly spent intervening time at Saudi Space Flight Center. He did his uh, thesis unofficially with Steve Snowden, who many of you know. Um, he then stayed at Goddard Space Flight Center, and he finally then settled at Johns Hopkins, which is where he comes to us now. His expertise is on the hot interstellar medium. He's written a bunch of papers, but you can see from the title of his talk, he's got it up there in code. Um, uh, solar Wind Charge Exchange, which is what also he was very expert on, and I think that's what his connection to Steve was. Um, Steve gave him, gave him his highest approval, and um, when we suggested uh, uh, somebody from Hopkins, you, you were Steve's choice. So you come with you know very high <laughs> approval rating from Steve. I guess you were working with Steve on the group stack that he was thinking about, that he, he thought about and was so excited about. Um, Steve was again very enthusiastic about your being here. And again, he's not here, but he gives you the highest chance of approval. And so with Steve's approval, I give you Kip Hooks to tell us about solar wind charge exchange from nuisance and hopefully now to you. So first, thank you very much to all of you for coming here. Thank you for the invitation. It is truly an honor to come here to talk about things X-ray at the umbilicus mundi of the X-ray astronomy world. Um, I really wish that Steve were here with us. This was a problem that he had sort of stumbled upon. He had great interest in it. And what we've done over the last year, I think, demonstrates that his ideas for CubeSat were, in fact, feasible. And at the end of the talk, you're going to see how some of those have grown uh, out of other institutions into almost reality. Um, I do have to make one slight apology for this talk. I was asked uh, several weeks ago to start drafting a review paper on SWIX, Solar Wind Charge Exchange. I call it SWIX because it's so much easier. Um, it's going to be entitled something like SWIX for Dummies. Um, so this talk is the first cut at the organization for that paper. So I'm going to talk about what SWIX is. I'm going to talk about how to avoid SWIX in our observations, because most of us would like to study something other than SWIX. I'm going to talk about some exciting, or at least exciting to me, advances that we've made in the last couple of years. And finally, I'm going to talk about how this really noxious, pestilential background that we have to cope with to do diffuse X-ray studies is actually going to turn into a key tool for the heliophysicists to understand some rather obscure physics uh, that's very important to us. So let me start with a little bit of history. Uh, SWIX first pops up early on in the ROSAT mission. We didn't know what it was at the time, but if you look at the ROSAT All Sky Survey, uh, if you look at the raw version, it's really, really ugly. And that's because there's a time variable component to the background. Nobody knew what it was. It had time scales from minutes to days. Um, and everybody was confused about what it was. Steve Snowden spent a large amount of time uh, minimizing the amount of this long-term enhancement, as it was called, in the Rosat All Sky Survey. And very early on, it was recognized that the uh, long-term enhancement rate during an observation of the moon was consistent with the, let's see here, turn it on, I think, on, yes, on. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm standing right here. It was consistent with the rate towards the dark side of the moon. So that meant that the bulk of the emission had to be coming from very close to the Earth. See, I'm not an engineer. Um, of course, the next step in the story is the flaming comets brought to us by Casey Liss. He was looking at comets to see reflected solar x-rays, and instead they were many, many times brighter than we had expected them. Shortly after that, there was a local bubble and beyond meeting in Garchink, and Don Cox said, it really doesn't matter that we don't know what the emission mechanism is, but if comets are extremely bright, 
and that's neutral material, then all the other neutral material in the solar system should also be glowing in the X-rays. And by that he meant the neutral interstellar medium that is constantly flowing through the solar system. Uh, at the same conference, Michael Freiberg pointed out that the long-term enhancements were somehow related to the solar wind. He didn't have the correlation yet. And what I'm pointing, showing down here, the red lines here are the long-term enhancements measured during the Rose et al. Sky survey. The dots are the solar wind flux scaled appropriately. You notice that this is about half a year, and that's how long the Rose et al. Sky survey took. It took uh, Tom Cravens and Steve Snowden a while working with the data to show, indeed, the long-term enhancements are, in fact, strongly correlated with the solar wind and, therefore, are likely to be charge exchange emission. Um, well, we all know what charge exchange is. Once you know that there is charge exchange, and it's going to be coming from everywhere on the sky, since the interstellar medium in the heliosphere is in all directions, you have to go back and reassess your thinking about a lot of observations you've done on the diffusive emission, and you find that you have made some serious mistakes, and some of those mistakes have developed into controversies. Uh, the local hot bubble is a construct created by Wisconsin to explain the fact that for the very soft X-ray sky at, say, 100 EV, there are X-rays in all directions. Since the mean free path at that energy is quite short, it's a couple hundred parsecs, you know that that emission has to be very close. And the local hot bubble, upon full development, became a fairly irregular region. The sun was sitting somewhere close to the center of it, and it was filled with million degree gas. Well, now, you the, now that we know about solar wind charge exchange, you can't get more local than the solar system. So the question became, is the emission that we have attributed to the local hot bubble actually due to this SWIX? And that was a controversy that raged quietly for about a decade. And for those of you who want to fall asleep a little bit later, the answer is the local hot bubble is still alive and well. And I'll show you more about that shortly. Besides controversy, SWIX causes a lot of observational problems. There's nowhere on the sky that you can look that is SWIX free. So if you want to study the soft X-ray background, diffuse emission from the Milky Way, emission from nearby galaxies or even clusters of galaxies, you really have to take it into account. There are multiple components. Not only is the ISM in the solar system glowing, but so is the outer parts of the Earth's atmosphere. And even though Chandra and XMM both have very high orbits, they're still looking through this glowing atmosphere. It's time variable, since the solar wind is time variable which means that if you want to do shadowing analyses the way I used to, you're sunk. And since its spectrum is very similar to that of a million degree plasma, to date there is no way of spectroscopically separating that emission out from the plasma in the background that you actually want to study. As of a decade ago, we had three observational issues. First, what's the zero level for this emission? Second, for a given observation with a current mission, can we actually say whether it's contaminated by SWIX? And finally, if it is contaminated by SWIX, can we model it and remove it? And again, the, the answers are going to be, well, we're very close to getting the zero level. Can we detect it? Sometimes. Can we model it? Um, uh, I'll leave that for later. So here's the introduction to the real problem. If you have a single line from charge exchange, the flux is the integral along the line of sight of the solar wind proton density, the neutral density, their relative velocities, the interaction cross-section, which in most cases is totally unknown, the abundance of the ion that's actually doing the charge exchange with respect to the solar wind proton density, a branching ratio, and a geometric factor. So what I'm showing in the bottom of this slide is a score sheet, and I'm going to return to this a number of times, with all the ingredients that we need to model the SWIX. The neutral distribution, which comes from reasonably good models, the solar wind ion distribution, which comes from MHD models, the cross-sections, I've coded that in red because many of them we don't know, 
The ion abundances, which we get from in situ measurements with ACE and Ulysses, and the branching ratios. Now, the branching ratios are in orange. There are problems with the branching ratios. That's Randall's work. I'm not going to talk about it. It's just in orange as a warning. So, to go through all these ingredients, I'm going to start out with the ion abundances. That requires a short primer about the solar wind. The abundance fraction and the ion fractions in the solar wind is a very complex issue. You can sit through hours and hours of talks and still not know everything there is to know. To really badly summarize this, the slow solar wind has, on average, a higher charge state, and it's a much more highly variable abundance uh, variation. You'll notice that I put slow into quotes. That's, that really is meant to scare you. Uh, the plot on the left shows the velocity of the solar wind as a function of solar latitude, as measured by Ulysses during a single orbit uh, during solar minimum. This is a sunspot number. You can see that at high latitudes, you have high velocities. In the equatorial plane, you have much lower velocities. At solar max here, you get both high and low velocity material at both high and low latitudes. When a heliophysicist talks about the slow solar wind, typically he means the low velocity solar wind in the equatorial plane. And by high, he typically means the fast polar flow. The fast solar wind that you do sometimes see in the equatorial plane does not have the same abundance ratios as the fast flow uh, in the poles. To summarize even more briefly, the abundance ratios of the solar wind through which we are observing not only depend sensitively on the solar phase, but where you're looking. If you're looking only within the equatorial plane of the sun, then it's mostly so slow solar wind. If you're looking at high solar latitudes, then you've got some slow solar wind close to you and then fast everywhere else. And for the purposes of this talk, you can think of the solar equatorial plane as being roughly the plane of the ecliptic. So if you want to do high ecliptic observations, you've got problems. Okay, I don't want to say much about how you measure the ion fractions to merely point out that it's a real mess. And all we really get out is the ion fractions for the dominant species. And this is a problem. Here's a plot that shows element versus ionization state. The boxes are the ACE data that we have for ions. In color, I've coded up the species that contribute most to the X-ray band. And you can see, for example, for oxygen 7, this is dotted because ACE doesn't do a very good job of measuring it, but that's the most important thing we have in the three-quarter keV band. So there's a mismatch between what ACE can measure and what we actually need. Going back to our scorecard, I put the ion abundances in orange because while we know a lot of them, we don't really know the ones we want to know. So I'm now going to turn to the neutral density distribution and the ion density distribution. As I said, there are two different regimes that we have to worry about. There's the heliospheric SWIX, which is due to the ISM floating through the solar system. These two plots um, are of the equatorial plane, the density distribution therein. The sun is at the center, and this edge is, I can't remember how many AU out it is. It's quite a ways. Uh, the point here is on the left we have hydrogen. Upwind, we have a very high hydrogen density. As you get close to the sun, that density drops remarkably quickly, and that's mostly due to photoionization. Helium, on the other hand, is not strongly photoionized, so the helium particles are actually gravitationally focused by the sun downwind into what we call the helium focusing cone. These models were originally built in the 1970s to study Lyman alpha backscatter and have applied for uh, been applied to a number of other problems since then, usually with great success, like energetic neutral atoms. So I'd say that these models are quite robust. Uh, these are models from Dimitri Kutrumpa, who's been working on this quite diligently lately. The ion distribution is a little bit more difficult. Since it's a wind, you know it's going to have a r to the minus 2 distribution. 
It's going to have some perturbations because there are very active regions on the sun spewing out dense solar wind. The sun rotates and so you see this spiral structure in the proton density. Um, the real problem here is that at any given time we have precisely one measure of the solar wind that's from ACE sitting right here at the Earth. Okay, there are a couple of other measurements, but they're all sitting here at the Earth. So if you actually want to reconstruct the structure of the solar wind in the solar plane or the plane of the ecliptic, you have to use the full time series of the data and interpolate. Um, there are MHD models that supposedly do this. Uh, they're called Enlil. Uh, their quality is yet to be de demonstrated. As much of a problem as this might seem, it's not actually bad because the bulk of the solar wind charge exchange from the heliosphere actually comes from relatively close, 75% from the nearest 3 AU. Uh, as you might imagine, if I'm sitting right next to one of these spirals, what I see depends strongly on where I look. If I'm looking perpendicular to the spiral, it really doesn't matter that I have these waves coming overcoming me and going past me, the amount of variation I see is relatively small and the amount of swicks I see is relatively small. But if I happen to be looking along one of these spirals, you see very strong variations from lots of swicks to not much. So if you have a project for which you need the swicks to be relatively stable, you really want to be looking perpendicular to the Parker spiral. Uh, as you go further out in the heliosphere, you're summing over many more different types of the solar wind. It tends to average out. There is some uh, time variation with the solar cycle, uh, but that's not terribly important for what we're doing. Once you get to the heliopause, the emission is virtually negligible. The problem really is high ecliptic latitudes or high solar latitudes. This is a cross cut through the same uh, MHD model I showed before. Here's the sun, here's the earth. You can see that in the vertical direction, there are all these wonderful bubble structures. Once you get further up here, we have no spacecraft monitoring. And yes, people do claim that they can reconstruct what the solar wind should look like from magnetograms, but it's really sketchy. So if you're looking up here, you have a hard time knowing what it is that you're looking through. Okay, that's the heliosphere. Oh, yes, and I want to point out this. This is a great result. Dimitra Kutrumpa has shown that looking through the equatorial plane is a much nicer thing to do than looking at high latitudes. Uh, she had a program with Suzaku to look at the same point in the sky multiple times a year for multiple years. MBM-12 is sitting within the equatorial flow. There's the observed values. These are the model values. You can see there's a very nice tight correlation makes you think you can actually model this stuff. The NEP, on the other hand, high latitude, you can see there's a trend, but it's not a very tight correlation. I don't think you can really model this. So, okay. The magnetosphere is the other main source of SWIX. Uh, that's basically the Earth's atmosphere interacting with the solar wind. The solar wind is highly magnetized. It's rushing towards the Earth at between 300 and 900 kilometers a second. It hits the Earth's magnetic field and it shocks. And so the ion density in this region is about four times higher than the standard solar wind. Um, the Earth is sitting down in here. These are units of Earth radii. So you see a bow shock, you see the magnetopause, you see the cusps. And you can see that this is going to be highly time dependent because the solar wind varies on the order of minutes. One of the other things that you can see is that what you see depends very strongly on where you are. So if your spacecraft is back here looking perpendicular to the Earth's sun line, then you're not going to see terribly much in the way of SWIX. If your spacecraft is down here and XMM gets down there a few times a year and you're looking up and XMM has been known to do that. You're looking along a lot of emission and you see it and it's very strong. In fact, the first uh, 
first notice that we had of charge exchange in the XMM archive was from such an observing geometry, and it was for the Hubble Deep Field North. Uh, you can see that, or you can imagine that, as the solar wind flux becomes stronger, the shock will move closer to the Earth, deeper into the atmosphere where there's a higher neutral density, and so the emission goes up. It's very nonlinear. If we want to model this, we can take a neutral distribution for, from the uh, atmospheric models. That's a Monte Carlo simulation. It has been occasionally compared with data. Uh, it agrees to a factor of two. Uh, most people can't agree whether it's two, a factor of two high or a factor of two low, but it's a factor of two. Um, seemingly, for a heliophysicist, this is enough. And we can get the ion distribution from MHD models. And there are multiple flavors. There's BATS or Rust, there's GUMIX, there's GGCM. Um, so on our scorecard, I'm going to put the neutral distribution as something we actually do understand. But I'm going to be reticent about the ion distribution um, for the moment. But now that I've told you where SWIX is and what it is, uh, I want to tell you about what's been fun about it lately, what's exciting about it. So here's our standard equation for a single line. If you are interested in a single line and you have the cross section for the interaction, then you're golden. If you're interested in a line that has no cross section, of course, you're sunk. If you're interested in a broad band, then you'd think there are thousands of lines in there for which we don't have cross sections. What am I going to do with that? Well, it turns out, observationally, it's a simple problem. So you just have to sum over all of your lines, and then you take this equation and you separate it into two pieces. One, this Q, is the integral along the line of sight of the solar wind proton density, the neutral density, and their relative velocities, all of which you think you know relatively well. Then you take the stuff that you don't know and you put it in the other half. And this terminal sigma is the production factor. So if you have measured a Swix flux and you think you know what the model is, then it's relatively trivial to solve for the production factor. Now, there are, of course, problems with this in that there are multiple neutral species that can be doing the charge exchanging. Within the solar system, it's primarily hydrogen and helium, but you could also be getting some charge exchange off of CO, for example. It's so minor we can ignore it, and I'm going to stick to just hydrogen and helium. So here's our plot of the quarter keV uh, long-term enhancement rate as a function of time, plus the uh, solar wind flux as a function of time. So if you are given a correlation between the LTE flux and the solar wind flux, and if you can go to the models, calculate this integral of the solar wind proton density and the neutral density and their velocities, and correlate that with the solar wind flux, then the solution is trivial. So here's the correlation. And I know that many of you will not think much of this correlation yet. So here's the LTE flux. Here's the solar wind flux. Yes, there is a lot of scatter there. Uh, you can fit it relatively easy, and that's the dashed line. Now, the interesting point here is that that dashed line has a very small intercept. In fact, it's slightly negative. That tells you that using this model, at zero solar wind, you have almost no long-term enhancement, which means that Steve did a pretty good job of removing the LTEs from the Rosette All Sky Survey. And I'll get back to the dispersion shortly. The other correlation we need to get is from the models. Now, it would be wonderful if we could sit down and simulate the magnetosheath for the entire Rosat All Sky Survey. We can't do it because we don't have the solar wind data. We don't have the compute punch. So what we can do is we can go to the CCMC archive of magnetospheric models and pull out a representative sample of simulations taken in different seasons with different interplanetary magnetic field configurations, um, sample them as if we were Rosat, and then plot the result against the solar wind flux. And you'll notice here that it really is nonlinear, but the nonlinearity doesn't start until you get to relatively high solar wind fluxes. 
Here's just a blow up, and you can see that it's roughly linear out to, say, 6 times 10 to the 8 in solar wind flux, and that's about the limit of our good LTE data anyway. Here it is just binned up, and the point I want to draw your attention to is there's a large dispersion here. That's not a problem with the models. It's a problem with the magnetosheath. It's not symmetric. And how it's not symmetric depends upon the direction of the interplanetary magnetic field, the IMF. So this dispersion is real. Now, we can get a good correlation out of this. Compare the two, we can pull out a production factor. Now, there are only about two people in the room who really care what this number is, but it's important because if you have the model, that is the Q, you've calculated for some interesting observational geometry, this is the number that you multiply it with to get out the number of ROSAT counts per second per square degree. So now that you've got this number, you can actually figure out whether your particular spacecraft design can actually see this stuff. Uh, the other th another thing you can do is take this value, apply it to this dispersion here, and calculate what type of dispersion you should be seeing in the long-term enhancement rate. That's the dotted lines. So the bulk of this dispersion is exactly what you expect from the dispersion in the models. So this is not something to actually worry about very much. Okay, that's a quarter keV. There are no missions right now observing in the quarter keV. The LTE rates were measured for the three quarter keV band where XMM and Chandra observe. Can we do the same thing there? The answer is no. <laughs> Why is this such a mess? We're not absolutely certain, but we think that the reason why this is such a mess is the three-quarter keV band is dominated by two lines, oxygen 7, oxygen 8. And so the value of the LTE flux should be a function of the solar wind flux plus the ion fraction. And so what we're seeing here is the result of the ion fraction. And we, we had no instrument measuring the ion fractions at the time, so we really can't do anything with this. Okay, enough of hydrogen. Helium. Well, remember the helium focusing cone? That's what is being depicted here in uh, an article that came from about 1970. It turns out that in early December, the Earth is actually in the focusing cone. So if you look in the antisolar direction, you see a lot of charge exchange emission. If you're six months before or six months after and you look in the same direction, you don't have much charge exchange contamination at all. So what we can do is, well, let me back up, the six months before and six months after, those are the ROSAT observing geometries. So what we can do is we can launch a sounding rocket in early December and look down the focusing cone, measure the flux, and compare it to what we saw in the ROSAT All Sky Survey. And the PI was Massimiano Gagliazzi. We used the proportional counters from the uh, Wisconsin All Sky Survey. These were the 12th and 13th launches for those detectors. Uh, they have ROSAT like quarter keV filters. So, schematically, ROSAT would have observed from here, our launch observed here. We did a great circle roll during part of our observation. The red is what ROSAT observed for that part of the sky. You can see that where we don't have the focusing cone, the data agree fairly well with the sounding rocket, or, or vice versa, I should say. This excess is the helium focusing cone. With a great deal of work, you can actually pull out the production factor. Now again, I don't think anybody here really cares the exact number. What is interesting, though, since we now have production factors for both hydrogen and helium, is looking at the ratio. It's about eight. A couple of years ago, we were expecting from the atomic data that we should see something like two. Um, is this a cause for worry? I don't know. There is rumor that an expert in this building says, well, Eight might be a little bit high, but four would certainly be acceptable. Uh, but I haven't been able to find him to, 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 to 
nail him down on that. So this is a caveat. Our production factors may not be exactly what they should be. Once you have production factors, you can do another piece of interesting science. Uh, on top is the Rosetta Sky survey before it was cleaned. So all those streaks are the long-term enhancements. The lower value, the, the, the lower map, is what happens after Steve cleaned it. That's the one we all know and love. From my discussion of the hydrogen production factor, we know that the, uh, the magnetospheric swix has been mostly removed, but we know that there's still heliospheric swix in here. And the first thing that Massimiano did once he had his production factor is he figured out how much charge exchange there should be in the Olsky survey due to the heliosphere. So the upper panel is not the quarter keV band precisely, that's the quarter keV emission thought to be due to the local hot bubble. On the same scaling is what the charge exchange emission is. The bottom line is that in the galactic plane, there are places where the charge exchange is about 40% of the local hot bubble emission. At high latitudes, it's more like 15%. So by removing the solo in charge exchange emission from the emission that we had thought was the local hot bubble, we actually do two wonderful things. The first thing is we change the shape of, of the local hot bubble. We make it more WASP wasted because we've mo removed more emission from the galactic plane than at high galactic latitudes. Um, for the Cognoscenti, this is what the new local hot bubble looks like in a number of cuts. Um, You'd have to sit down and really puzzle over these with the old ones to see where the differences are. But the bottom line is that once we remove the SWIX, the shape of the local hot bubble looks a lot more like the shape of the local cavity in the neutral material. So it looks now as if the hot material really does fill in the void in the neutral material. And I should point out that Rosine Lallemont told us that this would happen in 2004, and nobody listened to her. Uh, the other thing that this does is, since you've lowered the amount of emission, you've lowered the density, and you've lowered the pressure. So originally, we were saying that the pressure was something like 15,000 in P over K. Removing the SWIX reduces it to about 10,000. And if you measure the thermal pressure in the local, local interstellar cloud, which is a neutral cloud embedded in this hot gas, you get only about 3,000. And the difference in pressure has been used as an argument why the local hot bubble could not possibly exist. This poor little cloud would be flattened almost instantly. But if you're an astronomer and you're a scoundrel, you immediately leap to magnetic fields. From the pressure difference, you can calculate that the field that you need to keep everything in equilibrium is about 5 microgauss. Well, Voyager left the heliopause a couple of years ago and can now measure the magnetic field outside of the heliosphere. And lo and behold, it found a field of about 5 microgauss. Now, this may be totally fortuitous, but as of, you know, uh, as of last year, it appears that the local interstellar cloud and the hot gas are roughly in pressure equilibrium. So that's the long-winded way of saying the local hot bubble still exists, and it's not nearly the mysterious thing that it has been in the past. We think we have a little bit better idea of what's going on. OK, now that I've told you something about science, let's go back to observational problems. And let's tackle this ion distribution problem. So if we actually do understand the magnetosheath, then for any given observation, we should be able to model the SWIX that we see. Now, back in 08, I tried this with a mini survey from the XMM archive. So I looked for uh, places on the sky where there were multiple observations, all of which had different observing geometries. In particular, I was looking for observations where some of the observations had uh, an observing geometry up through the nose of the magnetosheath. And I found them, and they had nice strong swicks. 
But I also found observations with the same observing geometry that had no SWIX whatsoever, which was highly annoying. Um, and so I had to make up an excuse why we weren't seeing SWIX for those observations. And I said, well, the model I have for the magnetosheath is not actually an MHD model. It's a static model made up in the 1970s or 1960s. Um, so it's probably got the wrong scaling. And furthermore, since I'm working with XMM, I'm only working in oxygen 7 and oxygen 8. And oxygen 8 is not well measured. So there's a lot of room for, for, for error. Jenny Carter, shortly thereafter, used the same model, my code, applied it to the whole XMM archive. And here is a measure of the solar and charge exchange emission versus what her model, or my model, said it should be. And I don't see a correlation there, and I don't know what that red line is, so don't ask. Um, this was serious concern. The one thing that she could say that was positive was that when the spacecraft was between the sun and the earth, out here, in the same place where the nose of the magnetosheath is, you did tend to see more SWIX than if the spacecraft were behind the Earth. That was cold comfort. Of course, part of you know the, the story already. Just a couple of years ago, Brad did this right. He took events from the Chandra archive. He ran Batsaras. He found that some events had very good correlations. A larger number of events had Eh, okay correlation, and then there were some events that there was just no correlation whatsoever. Very ugly. And this has been confirmed by Ian Whitaker. I don't think the paper is out yet. He was using the XMM archive and he was using Gumix, but he came up with the same basic result. So what's the problem? The problem is the MHD models. There are at least four different flavors of MHD models available um, through the CCMC. Uh, our colleague, Yari Colada Vega, got interested in this problem. And so she found a solar wind event where uh, MMS had measured the location of the magnetopause uh, several times over a very short period of time, so just a couple of hours. So she took the solar wind data, she ran it through four different MHD models. Reality is the measured position of the magnetopause. The black are the four different models. Not at all what you would have expected. Um, now, this is a particularly bad case. There are examples where reality, this line, and the models aren't nearly so bad. But clearly, there are cases in which the models just aren't working. So an um, MHD model right out of the box is, is not a good idea. So I'm going to say we know something about the ion distribution, but we have a hell of a lot of work to do to figure out what's really going on. However, our problem turns out to be the magnetosheath's gain. This is a typical picture of the magnetosheath from a first-year heliospheric text. Um, I don't have time to go through what all is going on here, but what you should note is that there are four different plasmas and three different current groups. So you have the solar wind plasma going around the exterior of the magnetosheath. You have the plasma sheet in between the two halves of the magnetotail. You have the plasma sphere. You have the ring current. You have another current across the front of the, the nose of the magnetosheath, which then loops up and over. You have a current through the neutral sheet that then goes up and over. This is a complicated system. You kick it with a good gust of solar wind, and everything has to rearrange itself in a self-consistent way. And this is an excellent problem for MHD. People who write MHD codes love this type of stuff. The problem is that there's a lot of physics in here which is not MHD. And that physics is reconnection. And forget about text. Let's just look at somebody's toy model of reconnection. So you have the Earth's magnetic field pointed in one direction in the nose of the magnetosheath. The interplanetary magnetic field, the IMF, can have any arbitrary uh, direction with respect to that. Here they've shown you the nicest case where it's 
southward pointing, it's anti-aligned with the Earth's magnetic field. And you have nice reconnection here. You break open one of the terrestrial field lines. You connect it with your solar wind line. That allows the solar wind ions to get into the magnetosphere. They will travel along the line into the poles, into the cusp, making them very bright, making things like aurorae. Once you've done that, you then pull your field line back and drape it over the magnetotail. That's clearly not a, a situation that you can sustain, and so there's got to be reconnection back here somewhere. People disagree on exactly where to allow the, the magnetic field to relax and pull back. Now, there are a lot of scientific questions involved here. There are a number of them that I put here, but the two big ones are where does the reconnection actually occur? We know that it occurs somewhere around the nose. It depends upon the direction of the IMF. But other than that, we don't actually know where the reconnection occurs. Is it steady, like we saw in the movie, or is it bursty? There is some data that suggests that you can get a pileup of field lines in front of the magnetosheath nose, and they all reconnect simultaneously, so you get a burst. There's other data that suggests that at times it's very steady. These are not either or questions. These are more uh, a matter of reconnection seems to have different modes, that is, requiring different physical mechanisms, depending upon a lot of different variables. So the, the exact nature of the solar wind, what has been going on in the solar wind for the last couple of hours, seems to make a difference for reconnection. So let me skip this because it's not actually not that interesting. So how does what we're doing fit in with this? Well, reconnection controls where the magnetopause is. If you have reconnection, then you've broken open a terrestrial field line, connected it with the solar wind. That means the magnetopause gets moved back towards the Earth. Now, if you ask a heliophysicist, or actually better yet, ask several heliophysicists, ask three of them and you'll get six different explanations of how this process actually works. But they're all agreed that in reconnection, the magnetopause should get pushed back towards the Earth. So the magnetosheath is eroded. Um, and it also changes the shape of the whole magnetosheath, as well as producing spectacular results in the cusps, uh, such as aurorae. The solar wind charge exchange emission traces the solar wind ions. And the solar wind ions are telling you where the field lines are closed, where they're opened and where something is going on. So they define the location of the magnetopause and they tell you where the reconnection actually is. So if you can image the magnetosheath in soft x-rays due to charge exchange, you can actually track what's going on with the magnetopause and in fact the whole shape of the magnetosheath. So what has been a fly in the ointment for us for modeling this stuff turns out to be a very strong tool for studying where the reconnection actually occurs. Here is a simulation of what a spacecraft at 3RE from the Earth would see looking at the magnetosheath. Um, and for a typical solar wind, the emission here is comparable to or larger than the typical quarter keV background. That means we can actually see this stuff. We just need a large enough instrument. And this type of calculation is what inspired a proposal that was put in uh, by Steve Sembe and uh, Graziella Branduardi Raimond uh, for a joint ESA China mission, which has been approved to actually study the magnetosheath in the soft x rays with something known as a soft x ray imager, which basically has a field of view of about 20 degrees by 20 degrees. And it's hoped that this will break many of the degeneracies that have plagued studies of the magnetosheath. It's got a very highly inclined orbit. Um, <coughs> and I don't want to say much more about it. Uh, there is an unofficial American uh, contingent working on SMILE, and I'm part of that. Something that may be slightly more exciting, uh, Brian Walsh down the street at BU has proposed for and been accepted uh, for a 6U CubeSat. This is through the heliophysics program. Low Earth orbit, looking at the cusp from underneath. And so every orbit, it will measure the location and size of the cusp and start telling us where reconnection actually takes place. Uh, 
Um, it will also be looking through the flanks of the magnetosheath, which tells us something about the, uh, the production factors that I've been measuring with ROSAT. And I'd be well remiss if I didn't mention the HaloSat satellite, in part because the PI used to be here for many years. This is Phil Carrot's baby. I'm involved with this one as well. And the whole idea is to measure oxygen 7 and oxygen 8 over most of the sky. The calibration program, that's me, um, will look at the helium focusing cone in the oxygen lines and actually determine, well determine, the production factor in oxygen 7 and oxygen 8 uh, interaction on helium. We are also going to be looking through the flanks of the magnetosheath doing the same type of thing we did with ROSAT in oxygen 7 and oxygen 8 to get the production factor on hydrogen. So with these three missions, we will actually be doing a lot of work to understand the magnetosheath, which means that the MHD people are going to have to keep up with us, which means that at some point there will be MHD models which will allow us to take care of modeling the solar wind charge exchange that happens to be in our observations, we hope. So uh, I'm going to quit there. I'm not going to bother with my summary slides because I've been all over the place in this talk and trying to summarize it would be uh, ridiculous. But I hope you now have an idea of where the SWIX is, what type of problem it is, how you can avoid it in your observations. You've gotten a taste that maybe there's something exciting going on. And you certainly have gotten the idea, I hope, that our Garbage photons are somebody else's prize and joy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wake everybody up. Pushing lights. Where are the lights here? I see things for audio. Oh, down at the bottom. There you go. Okay. Comments and questions? So, <clears throat> we're talking about the geothermal. I mean, the important aspect is where the nucleus are and their density and all that. Right. <clears throat> and they're also not modeled well in MHD, <laughs> obviously. Um, so, the, the fraction of the ions that you lose to charge exchange is relatively small. And so, if your MHD doesn't have those neutrals in it, that's not really a problem. But the SWIX is creating the neutral interacting with the ions. Right. <clears throat> so you have an MHD model to tell you where the ions are, and you have a totally separate model to tell you where the neutrals are, and you just sort of slam them together. These are using like kinetic models for the neutrals? Uh, this is a Monte Carlo model, Monte Carlo model created by Hodges a long time ago. It's about the only good model for the atmosphere. Um, and as I said, it's been experimentally tested. It's to within a factor of two or so of being correct. I would love to improve that model. And one of the things that we will do with the SMILE mission is we will figure out what the neutral densities have to be. Precisely. There are no plans on anywhere for anything to replace ACE. And ACE is currently not well. If you look at ACE from five years ago, you got the full suite that I showed you. If you look at ACE data from last year, you get about half that number of species. So. Everybody in heliophysics knows that they need to be measuring the ion abundances in the solar wind, but there's just simply um, not been an opportunity for someone to propose such a mission. Paul? What percentage of the total spectrum is oxygen 7 and oxygen 8? Also, there should be some oxygen 6. Uh, yes, there should be oxygen 6. Um, it's a... Uh, if you look at the total X-ray spectrum, it's relatively small. If you're just looking at the three-quarter kV band, then it's most of it. So um, 
let me, I can do this very quickly. The Dimitra Kutrumpa has oops, put together this spectrum. This isn't as good as what Randall has produced, but you can see the oxygen eight and oxygen seven are here. And so if you're looking at this, just this portion of the spectrum, that dominates. As soon as you move down a little bit, then it's this forest of lines here that really dominates. So uh, for Chandra and XMM, the oxygen lines are what we worry about. If you've got ROSAT, then it's everything else. It's, I think both measurements have very large error bars, and so the error bars do overlap. Um, that's one of the reasons why we did a second launch last December. Um, we also did uh, three different filters last December. We have a C band, a B band, and a BE band. Um, so we should be able to figure out what the spectral shape is a little bit better, and then we might have a better idea of how well we match with Randall. Right now, they're a little bit disjoint in energy. So they're in the same ballpark, but we have more work to do there. Last question? If not, let's thank you again. So let me turn this off. Um, well, let me just unclip myself. So Steve's CubeSat was going to be low Earth orbit.